it's time to address the difference between staking, which is something very normal that we're used to in Cardano, and token locking. I'm going to argue that one of those things seems to make sense, while the other one sometimes only seems to make sense for the people asking you to do it. Ready? Let's go. Today, we're going to discuss token locking in crypto, ADA plus LimeWire, the scourge of VC coins striking again, the Fed rate hike today, and as predicted, the death march of PacWest. If you're wondering what kind of person would wear a gold jacket to go look at his gold at the gold vault, or if you're finding value in these videos each weekday, please consider delegating to the Army of Spies stake pool, ticker AOS. Let me make it very clear that what I'm about to say is not commentary on any specific project. But I think as a general matter, Matthew Plowman makes a very good point here. He says, can anyone give me a reasonable explanation why locked staking is a good thing for anyone except the project's founders? Okay, everyone, lock your tokens. If you really believe in what we're doing, we'll give you more tokens. Me? The team? Well, no, we aren't locked. And this is... A pretty good, pretty good expression of what you're afraid of when you see that some new project is asking you to lock your tokens, lock your token tokens that you've purchased from them back with them. You know, your first thought, if you're not accustomed to how frequently this happens in crypto, your first thought is, wait a second, what? I just bought these from you. Now you want me to lock them back up with you. Why would I ever do that? And of course, the answer is because they're offering you something. There's some incentive to lock your tokens. And it's usually being the recipient of the issuance of more tokens. And you're like, okay, great. Uh, I'll lock my tokens and they'll give me more tokens for locking them. And after you think about that for approximately a quarter second, you suddenly realize that you're just keeping pace with the inflation of the token if you're locking. If you're locking your token, it's basically like there's going to be inflation of the token. They're obviously going, some people are going to lock and they're going to issue new tokens as an incentive and inducement for those people to lock. So if you don't lock, you're basically going to lose some of the value in your token. There's going to be inflation in the token, token, and you're not going to be a recipient of some of those newly issued tokens. So people, people will lock. This is part of the dynamic that leads to people locking their tokens. But the question is, is this good for anybody except the project? And of course, there's this little analog. They love to sort of analogize staking in Cardano. They're, you know, they know that people will be susceptible to this because staking is a normal part of Cardano. But I want to distinguish these two things. I'm going to argue that staking in Cardano is a pretty normal thing. And locking tokens, locking project tokens can often be something very different. So in staking, it's the similar kind of dynamic as at play. You know there are going to be staking rewards issued to people. There's an emission schedule for ADA. More ADA gets issued as staking rewards as time goes on. And if you are not staking and getting those rewards, you know, the amount of outstanding ADA, the amount of ADA that's been issued and is sort of out in the wild is going to be increasing with every epic. And if you're not getting those staking rewards, you know, other people will be getting those staking rewards. And so your sort of slice of the pie, whatever number of coins you have divided by the total number of outstanding ADA, that little fraction will become smaller and smaller because while your numerator will stay the same, the denominator will keep growing with the continued emissions of ADA. But when you're part of a proof of stake system, you're helping with the validation of the blockchain. You're staking as part of a proof of stake system. This is how the validation is going to work. It's part of the security of the blockchain. We don't let just anyone validate the next block. We let people validate the next block who have some delegation. It's how we secure the chain. There's a reason for the staking. We couldn't just let anyone sort of spin up a validator 
and validate blocks at will if there was no was no delegation because attackers people who are going to engage in malicious behavior it would be easy for them to stick up to spin up a validator or you know 10,000 validators and start maliciously validating blocks which is why the validation the delegation serves a purpose it, it helps secure this this proof of stake system we have there's a purpose for staking your ADA in the Cardano ecosystem. But of course, the normalcy of staking in a proof of stake ecosystem like Cardano makes the average member of the ecosystem a little bit more susceptible to something that looks a lot like staking, but which today I'm just going to sort of generically call token locking. All of these projects, at least you know, a, a very large proportion of them have been using, you know, the issuance of tokens as a means of fundraising and as, as a means of uh, uh, capital formation because they have to pay for their project and they've been using token cells to pay for their projects. So what happened pretty quickly was that people people decided there was a step two. The project decided, okay, step one is we do the token cell. We make a bunch of money. But then there's a step two, and here's where things get a little dicey. And I'm not saying every project is like this. I'm not even saying any specific project is like this. I am saying there are projects where these things are, these ideas are playing a role. So what happens is they know that people in a proof of stake system are already kind of susceptible to, you know, token locking because it looks and feels a little bit like the normal staking that happens in a proof of stake system. And then they say to themselves, these projects, hey, um, we're the project, we're the founders and the, the team members and the projects probably got some tokens it wants to sell and the founders and the team, they sure do have some tokens they want to sell. And of course they're human beings. So they want the price to be high when they go to sell those tokens. So what could help the price be high? The things that could aid in a high price <laughs> are are the project becoming, you know, very useful and valuable or the token being scarce. There not being a lot of the token, at least not a lot of the token on the open market. And that's something they can accomplish pretty pretty easily by having everybody lock their token. They say to themselves, "Hey, if we create some inducement for everybody to lock their token, then those tokens will be locked up and there won't be as many tokens out on the open market, which they hope means less selling pressure. There'll be less downward pressure on the price. Fewer people will be out there trying to sell their tokens. So there'll be less downward pressure. And those buyers, they'll be able to buy the team's tokens and the project's tokens and the founder's tokens though, because they're not going to lock their tokens. They're just going to get all of the public, all of us to lock the tokens. And the way they're going to do this is through the aforementioned ongoing issuance of new tokens. Hey, lock your tokens and we'll give you more tokens, you know, at, at this, you know, roughly this yearly rate or whatever it is, or weekly rate or every epic, you'll get this many tokens, whatever it is. You know, they come up with all kinds of creative ways to uh, describe the issuance of those new tokens to you, but it's always just enough to get you to lock your tokens because they want those tokens off the market so that when it's time for them to sell their tokens, they don't have to compete with you for the same buyers. They don't want to compete with their community for the same new buyers coming into their, coming into their community. They want to be the ones selling to those new buyers so they can exit. They want to be able to exit the market. And, you know, often there's some other reason. There's there's some other reason for locking the tokens. Sometimes they need to centralize liquidity. You know, a lot of these projects are DeFi projects. And there are a lot of different reasons why you want to centralize liquidity in all kinds of different DeFi platforms, all kinds of protocols. If it's a DEX, you know, or some kind of a lending protocol, we have these liquidity pools. And... For those liquidity pools to work, you need to centralize a bunch of liquidity in there. So they have you, you know, lock your tokens and it accomplishes the two things simultaneously. It gets those tokens off the open market and it centralizes a bunch of liquidity that they can then use to, you know, do swaps or fund loans or, you know, be the secondary sort of, you know, uh, liquidation pool if, 
if a loan is liquidated, you know, something like that, and there's not enough collateral to cover the loan, all kinds of reasons. We're, we're sort of familiar with all these different reasons why you need to centralize liquidity in DeFi platforms, DeFi protocols. But the question you need to ask yourself is, would any of these projects be so interested in token locking? Would, would total value locked be the metric we would even care about, if not for that first thing, that it gets your tokens off the market so that the team, the project, the founders can all exit, so they can exit the project, so they can sell their tokens, because that's why they're in it. I mean, I'm sure you can, you know, somebody will be able to come up with some example of some founder somewhere who, you know, truly wanted to just, you know, you know, use the platform or lock his own, his or her own tokens or whatever, whatever it might be. I'm sure that founder exists out there somewhere too, but the rest of them, they're trying to exit. They issued themselves those tokens because they were going to sell them. At some point, they wanted them to become valuable and sell them and having you and me and everybody else lock our tokens is one way they think they can make those tokens more valuable. Like I said, there are other reasons to lock tokens too, but you have to ask yourself, how much of this locking would be going on in crypto if it wasn't for maybe the main purpose of getting your tokens off the market so that there's less selling pressure? Do you love it when the strength of the Cardano community is vastly underestimated? I sure do. And it looks like we got a little bit of that today. Here's LimeWire posting. And yes, we'll, we'll go back and talk about LimeWire. LimeWire posting, calling the Cardano community, should we integrate ADA as a payment method for the ongoing public sale? 300 retweets and ADA will be live on our platform tomorrow. 300 retweets. If you're if you're paying attention to the Cardano community, you probably saw this and scoffed and knew exactly what would happen. Here we are. Did they get 300 retweets? No. They got 1309. We exceeded that 300 threshold by 1000. LimeWire was probably not prepared for the immense strength of the Cardano community. But if you were around a couple decades ago, you probably remember LimeWire and you're like, wait a second, LimeWire, how can this be? If you were too young to have lived through this, back you know, over 20 years ago, two decades ago, we had Napster and LimeWire and some other peer-to-peer -peer file sharing programs. And it was sort of like the first taste mainstream society got of digital piracy. So that was going on. And then by 2010, there was a big lawsuit and there was an injunction issued against LimeWire and LimeWire st stopped distributing this peer-to-peer -peer file sharing software. Fast forward, according to, uh, according to Wikipedia here, and here's what's going on now. Wikipedia says on March 9th, 2022, and I don't know if this is true. I haven't double checked this, but here's what Wikipedia says. On March 9th, 2022, brothers Paul and Julian uh, Zahatmeyer announced that they would revive LimeWire as a music-based NFT platform through the new marketplace, though the new marketplace is not affiliated with LimeWire's original team. The NFT marketplace was launched in July 2022 with the first NFT collection from American record producer and rapper Seven Aurelius. Mark Gorton has expressed his pleasure with the reuse of the LimeWire name in this way. And I believe Mark Gordon was the creator of the original LimeWire. A lot of us in Cardano have spent a decent amount of time over the last year or so warning about the dangers of VC coins. And you might have noticed that Sui was sort of trending on social media over the last day or two. And the outcome we've seen with Sui has been in line with what a lot of people have talked about when it comes to VC coins. Here, Mr. Kata says, ah, yes, the typical VC private distribution of pre-launch tokens into the epic dump on retail. And the graphic he posted looked like this. Certainly, that is not what you like to see if you are a holder of the SUI coin, I'm assuming. That shot of the chart was from this morning, but if you want to see what's happened since then, it looks like it just kind of flatlined and hasn't gotten really much better throughout the course of the entire day.
But you're probably aware the really big news today came out of the Federal Reserve. Jerome Powell, your main man, has been up to his normal owl stuff. Look at this picture. He's kind of like, I, I feel like he's kind of posing here to hide his, his uh, the owl part of his lineage. I've, I've, uh, I've maintained for a long time that I'm, I'm utterly convinced at least one of his grandparents was certainly some kind of owl. I don't know what type, probably a barn owl, but some type of a some type of an owl is in his family family tree. And I think he's uh he's realized that people are catching on. He's sort of posing in, you know, sort of the side pro three quarter profile thing so that people don't pick up on the the owl part of his lineage. But he's been doing owl stuff again today. We got a 25 basis point hike, bringing the federal funds rate to 5 to 5.25 percent. This is pretty high, but there was there was a, a ray of sunshine for some analysts. They removed the line that mentioned additional policy firming. We talked about this last time. We looked at the uh, we looked at the exact uh, markup of the changed language last time, and we talked about this phrase, additional policy firming. It looks like they've removed that language from the draft we saw today. So people are taking this to mean that we may not see additional hikes. We may just see a pause, which is a little welcome relief to people because we haven't seen this 5 to 5.25% for a long time. And the exact time when we saw it previously is not very comforting. Zero Hedge points out that exact timing with this post. Back to where we were in 2006, and now the fun part begins. And you probably realize that this, the last time we were at this 5 to 5.25% range, was right at the beginning of the great financial crisis when the Fed then had to drop the rate all the way back down here to almost nothing and then maintain that rate all the way from here until it looks like the beginning of 2016. So of course, Elon noticed this and said, it's almost like there's a pattern. And of course, what he's predicting is that we see something like this again, which, you know, is pretty looks pretty ominous. If we see this again, that things could be, this could be pretty, this could be pretty ominous if Elon is correct and we see a repeat of this pattern. And if you're wondering why I would have these owl suspicions about your boy, Jay Powell, look, here's how we looked in the actual presser today. This is how we looked at the presser. Check out those glorious eyebrows. Look at the stance as if he's in a tree somewhere and he finally sees a mouse. A mouse makes the wrong move. A mouse leaves cover and he notices, you know, maybe it's 75 yards out, maybe it's 50 yards, but he notices. Now is the time when he will pounce. He, the, the mouse doesn't even realize the mistake it's made. If you're telling me there's not an owl in that family tree, you're crazy. You probably remember from yesterday, Arthur Hayes was predicting that Pac West would be the next bank to see its demise. And sure enough, what did we get but this today? Look at those fantastic red candles. Not fantastic if you are a holder of PacWest, obviously, but those are some pretty extreme red candles. And it does indeed look like PacWest might be on the death march. People are already predicting today that we may see the FDIC take control of PacWest before the week is up. Finally, we all saw something today that I don't think we've ever seen or maybe we haven't seen in a long time. So CNBC was interviewing Senator John Kennedy from Louisiana, and he said something I've never heard a sitting senator say. They were talking about the banking system and what's going on in U.S. banking right now. And he sort of just nonchalantly said, hey, don't take this the wrong way. But the thing with the banking system, it's really just a big Ponzi. <laughs> this is the kind of thing. You know, you you don't expect a sitting senator to say, and you certainly don't expect everyone to just sort of accept it. But he kind of laid that out, and the reaction, you know, that I've seen so far has sort of just been like, yeah, probably. Of course, this is not something that seems very foreign to all of us in crypto. This is something we've sort of maintained for a long time. So to finally see a sitting senator saying this in the mainstream media 
things things might actually be swaying towards crypto now. But I hope you're having a great week and I'll talk to you tomorrow.